Tomas, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Gabor, for this most kind uh, introduction. Uh, I just want to double check whether uh, you can see my PowerPoint presentation. Yes. Okay, so the title of my presentation is uh, Social Legitimacy of Courts in Times of Constitutional Reckoning. And there are three parts of my, uh, of my argument. First, I would like to uh, define for you what I mean by the term uh, constitutional reckoning and institutional fragility, uh, which is uh, of particular relevance for, for courts. Uh, the second part of my argument uh, deals with uh, building an argument for courts as uh, social actors, because we've been talking about courts as political actors. But I think the uh, current predicament that we are dealing with uh, in many European countries goes back to this underdeveloped discussion that we never had about the social uh, legitimacy of courts. That is to say, to understand this, the courts in their social setting and in their social environment. And finally, uh, which uh, the third part, which will take the bulk of my, uh, of my time, uh, is to suggest some, uh, what I call signposts for, for our discussion of how best to frame the social function of uh, courts. So briefly, uh, let, me, let, me, let me first uh, draw the battle lines. What I mean by constitutional reckoning? Uh, constitutional reckoning uh, in 21st century uh, means that uh, the courts uh, and more generally all institutions that are uh, anti-majoritarian come under the uh, relentless attacks from uh, different political powers which claim that those institutions are undemocratic, they do not represent the will of the people and as such should be captured should be uh, brought under the thumb of uh, uh, governmental power uh, and so and so on. Uh, so this new dangerous world comes with this overarching narrative that uh, if, you, if your mandate does not come from the democratic elections that you are not good enough to uh, make decisions that would bind uh, public in general. Only those who come with the democratic mandate, democratic means uh, very in, in very majoritarian and very uh, plebiscitarian terms, have the uh, have the power to speak on behalf of the people, and as such, the courts do not have that kind of a mandate. So, uh, with uh, with this, the question arises: What happens when courts are being attacked with this overarching doctrine of uh, uh, enemies of the people, uh, anti-majoritarian? Uh, uh, themes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and uh, all too long the argument has been that the courts will be able to fend off any such attacks on the basis of uh, their legal uh, uh, ma legal mantle. That is to say, the anchoring in the legal system, the normative competences that the system grants to the judges to uh, decide cases, would be enough for the government or any political power for 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 that reason to stop short of actually capturing uh, the judges, that the legal legitimacy would be in itself enough to put the judges in the safe place. And I think this, this argument has been proven uh, incorrect. Uh, and I'm speaking from my own experience in Poland, but suddenly my argument goes beyond Poland and Hungary. Rather, I want to see Poland and Hungary as a cautionary tale of what happens when our trust in the institutions uh, is uh, proving to be uh, not based in factual, factual uh, situation. Uh, in other words, how to, define, how to define the social legitimacy of any institution and courts in particular. And I would propose that uh, to answer this question, we have to take the, uh, uh, three dimension perspective. First, to see the social legitimacy as a property, as an attribute of an institution. Then to understand social uh, legitimacy as a process. Social legitimacy is something that is in the process of becoming of a constant renewal. And finally, social legitimacy as a perception. So social legitimacy uh, as a property. So when I, when I understand and I try to analyze social legitimacy as a property, I ask myself the question, when institutions are regarded as justified and deserving of support for reasons that would go beyond fear of sanction or coercion. 
That is to say, what kind of attributes would make a case for the judges to wield this popular support, to garner trust, uh, to create a confidence in the stakeholders of the justice system. Uh, social legitimacy as a process, most crucially, it is not a given. It is not carved uh, in stone, rather it's a dynamic process. It's a vari variable that is a function of context, history and culture and legitimacy, social legitimacy always builds as a result of renewal and practice. For, for social legitimacy to be anchored in public perception, which will be my next argument, it must be practiced and it must be renewed on a daily, daily basis. So social legitimacy of any institution must not be taken for granted because the legitimacy and social anchoring uh, always arises as a result of this interaction between multiplicity of actors and different factors then, that come into play. So, this traje trajectory of social legitimacy has uh, three steps. Uh, and the first one is the one that we uh, uh, keep forgetting. First of all, if you really want to ask yourself a question, how strong are the judges uh, in the democratic setting? You have to start with the social anchoring of the judicial function. So social anchoring of the judicial function is the result of this ongoing process of social legitimacy becoming on a daily uh, self-repeating self -repeating, uh, basis. Uh, then if you have the social capital in place, you have to ask a second order question. What, how, and why the judges in a given social setting are doing? How are they performing? In order to build on this capital, which was my first step, or rather to uh, lose the capital uh, that was at the beginning, but start shrinking as a result of judges not living to the promise of the inbuilt uh, capital. And uh, my, final, my final step in this trajectory is to build a feeling of common cause on the basis of those two first steps that translates the social capital into a feeling that actually judges are doing something for the citizens, are doing something for, the, uh, uh, for defending the constitutional essentials of the state when threatened with uh, captured, in order to make sure that the people don't see the judges as simply self-interested in self-defending themselves. So this is the social function of courts. So you go beyond the self-interest on the basis of inbuilt capital, and only then you can project a social function of courts uh, of uh, talking about possibly recapturing the judicial independence. But if you don't build on the first step, you don't have a chance moving forward because the social capital is missing uh, to start to start with. And then, and then. Uh, if you have those three, if, if you have those three dimensions, then the question is uh, how how can the judges themselves go about uh, uh, building the social uh, capital, uh, remembering it as a process, and remembering that uh, the process affects in turn social perceptions of uh, of the judicial function. And I have three building blocks for our discussion about the social legitimacy of uh, of the judges. First. The judges themselves have to be in step with how the law changes. The law is not only a sword to punish, but first of all, you build the confidence and trust in people's hearts when you show people that actually courts are there to protect you. So the law becomes more and more a shield to protect against the omnipresence and uh, om omnipowerful uh, uh, state. And then you have different uh, uh, different features of this ever-changing nature of law. You have law as conflict, uh, law as situational, law as something that is effective. And this is how people understand the law. Uh, the law only reaches you when it is applied in practice, when it is uh, 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 
possible and capable of changing an individual situation. And the law reaches me, an individual, by way of a judicial intervention, that is to say, judicial interpretation. So stay in uh, uh, step with the uh, changes uh, that the law uh, undergoes. Uh, second, uh, try to bridge the gap between the people's expectations and the quality of, of performance. There are more and more and lo more laws. There are more and more procedures. So people do have more and more expectations of the judges and the performers on the basis of uh, such an ever evolving system must be in step with the people's uh, expectations of effective justice. And uh, for my understanding of social legitimacy, the most important element is to properly understand the legal interpretation because the legal interpretation is how you build the confidence in people's minds. So not only you feel the sensitivity that there is something missing uh, as a judge, but you have to change your interpretive routine to break the status quo. No more business as usual, no more sending people away on the pretext of uh, uh, imprecise uh, two general provisions. Judges do have their own promises and the promises of the courtroom is to provide an effective legal protection against ever powerful uh, state. Uh, so this legal, uh, th this legal interpretation element as a tool to build social legitimacy is, is extremely important. My third point, you have to transition from a right to a court, that is the access aspect, to a right to a good judge. And here the discussion shifts to another gear. You ask the question about how my right to a uh, judge is a, a, a accompanied by some procedural safeguards that would make my right to a judge a, a right that is really felt, that is really effective. And in that regard, uh, you have uh, number, you have point number four. This is where justice meets efficiency. And uh, point number five, moving beyond result-based justice. So procedural satisfaction and making sure that people do have their day in court is as important uh, as anything in building the social legitimacy. You have to have the feeling that you have been heard. Not only, not only you can say that, okay, I lost the case, but people should be ready to acknowledge, okay, I lost the case, but I'm ready to return to the court because I was heard, I was given consideration and my, my arguments were heard. And I still feel that this procedural element of uh, right to a court is still underappreciated by the judges themselves. Uh, number, number six, uh, challenge of the new self-perception self of the judges. Independence as a privilege must be repaid with performance. Independence must go hand in hand with accountability. So independence is not a tool to shield the judges off from the outside world. Rather, independence is something that should be earned by the judges with how they go about delivering justice to each individual that, uh, uh, that appears uh, in the courtroom. And I think this mental aspect of independence this internalization of judicial independence is as much important as the outside appearances of uh, uh, independence. Do the judges have inside themselves this inner space where they feel independent to deliver, to deliver justice, to go beyond uh, the, the text in order to open up the system to provide decisions that are indeed reasonable, uh, just, pragmatic. This is well beyond the traditional discussion of independence as a privilege. Independence as a privilege, yes, but privilege that must be earned on a permanent daily basis with performance. Uh, number, number seven, move beyond formalism. So I, I mentioned the term uh, promises uh, of the uh, judiciary. So what are the promises of the judiciary uh, uh, in times of constitutional reckoning? First of all, you have to understand, because this is what people expect you to understand, that judging, judging is no longer automatic. Your color is gray, and you, the judge, must search for this well-rounded, balanced solution 
to the case knowing that your, your decision will never be perfect because the law itself is imperfect. Law changes and the judges must do away with the myth of black or white world. They no longer live in such a uh, bi-dimensional uh, world. The color is gray. Number eight, embrace the culture of justification. So this shift is from power of arguments. I, the Supreme Court hereby sentence you to a fine. To arguments, from arguments of power to power of arguments. Not only you sentence somebody, but you explain why you are doing what you are doing. So this explaining aspect of the judicial power is crucial in building the social legitimacy. It is not only what you say as a judge, but how you say it. Uh, number, number nine, uh, social function of the courts at the service of the citizens. What I mean by that? Uh, first of all, uh, you have to understand as a judge that citizens know about the law as much as they learn about the law in the courtroom. So how the judges treat people in their courtroom is crucial to building this uh, positive perception of the judicial power. So to refocus the perspective from the negative to the positive, at least in my part of Europe, the discussion centers too much on what the judges cannot do. My argument is different. In times of constitutional reckoning, you have to ask what the judges have to do in order to stay true to their ethos of judging. And finally, number, number, number 10, uh, importance of public perception. No longer everyone is guilty but me. Judges do have to accept responsibility because with great power comes even greater uh, scrutiny. And uh, I know Gabor, uh, I should be uh, wrapping it up and I'm doing it now. So finally, what, uh, what, lies, what lies ahead? My argument is to reconsider the judicial ethos in its social context. And in order to that, we have first to imbue our thinking of judges with the virtue driven uh, approach. So uh, art of listening, accepting of my limits as a judge, humility, learning from the other. This is what should define a process that we call good judging. Good judging that goes beyond automatism, but actually sees the people in flesh and blood. And this is how you build social legitimacy. Uh, learn, secondly, learn how to describe this new and dangerous world. You have to understand that your judicial discretion equals choice. At some point, you have to make a choice as a judge. You have to balance various interests so that the people can actually see that a judge that balances that sees those, those different colors and hues is actually a useful judge for the public. Uh, number, uh, number three, uh, learn how to go beyond the legal text because people's expectations are not anchored in the legal text, which is all too often imprecise, uh, uh, does not make sense. So the promises are of the judges to make sense of this legislation that often uh, that all too often does not make uh, sense. And finally, finally, uh, uh, every time, every time I uh, 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 speak to the judges and I uh, uh, teach at various seminars, I, I cannot stop reminding myself of uh, wise words uh, uh, by my good colleague uh, and mentor, uh, uh, Justice Aharon Barak, who in his wonderful book, Judge in a Democracy, ended his uh, reflections arguing that for him, judges has been always a sort of uh, slavery because every time he set a trial, every time he was supposed to decide on what should be the punishment, uh, he was standing on trial, on trial of public, of public uh, opinion. And finally, finally, uh, on, a Polish, on a Polish note, in the old Poland, at the entrance to the courtroom, there was uh, an exhortation above, uh, above, above the entrance that said, justitias vestras judicabo, which means that we will be all judged, or in other words, your justice judge will be judged, judged one day. And this, this feeling of humility, this feeling of deferral, and this feeling of modesty must be a building block for social legitimacy. Uh, once we have this, I can say, 
that it's not just a court, it is my court. And with that, uh, any, kind, any, any attempts at capture, be it by Kaczynski or Orbans of this world, will come to nothing because the public support will be the final, the final uh, bulwark of uh, resistance for the judges. Thank you.